Hello, this is Don Labriola from Quicksilver Controls, and we're going to cover our implementation of CAN and CAN Open. In this segment, I'm going to cover the CAN bus physical design, which includes the transceiver, why the bus requires a termination in order to operate, the structure of the data frame and how arbitration works within the CAN system, and finally, how maximum cable link interacts with the arbitration process. First, the CAN transceiver. The CAN transceiver is basically set up to be a differential wire ORD transmission system. Whenever TXD goes active, CAN H will go high and CAN L will go low, producing a differential voltage across the bus. RXD monitors the bus and if it sees more than half a volt differential between CAN high and CAN low, it will go through and produce an active signal. If TXD is inactive, then both the upper and lower transistors will be turned off and the diodes will isolate them from the bus. The diodes also allow more than one transceiver to be on at the same time without back driving, whichever produces the highest high level will be sourcing and whichever is producing the lowest low level will sink, but we'll still end up with a differential voltage across the bus. Note the termination resistors are needed to cause the bus to return to zero after being driven to an active or dominant state, and the bus will not work without termination. Here's an example of a CAN bus with three nodes on it. Note the 120 ohm termination on each end of the bus. This is meant to match the impedance of the bus itself, which for a nominal 22 gauge uh, twisted pair set is very close to 120 ohms. Note that with multiple transceivers in there, more than one can be driving at a time. If any of our driving the bus, that's considered the dominant state, and it overcomes the passive state of any of the nodes that are not transmitting. So the dominant state will cause the bus to have a voltage across it. If all of them are in passive state, none of them will be driving the bus, and the termination resistors will cause it to go to zero volts, which is the passive state. Here's a typical CAN frame. After a minimum end of frame time or inactive time on the bus, a start of frame can be asserted, which is a dominant bit. After the start of frame, which all the nodes that have a data to transmit will also generate, then all nodes with data to transmit start to send their COB ID, which is communicator object. It identifies what the contents of the frame are. So the contents of the frame are completely dependent on how they're defined by their particular COB ID, and each COB ID is unique. It can only be used by one node and cannot be shared. So that as these are sending their data across, uh, we're able to identify what the data is and also use for arbitration, which we'll get to in the next slide. It includes a control field in there, uh, the number of data bytes to be sent, and then the data itself, followed by a CRC, and finally an acknowledge slot. The acknowledge slot means that you need to have at least two nodes on a bus in order to have CAN work because at least one other node must acknowledge the data frame or will be resent. Finally, there's the end of frame, the tight quiet time between packets to allow synchronization uh, if a new node were to come on within an already active system. So it's a synchronization period. You see a couple of modifications in here. Go through and do both 11 and 29 bit COB IDs. Most applications that we'd be involved in, the 11 bit are more than sufficient. Uh, 2048 messages, but if you do have a need for more, you can go out to 29 bits. Uh, finally, there's a stuff bit in there. If we have too many bits of the same state, either highs or lows, one bit of the opposite polarity will be inserted 
to go through and keep from losing synchronization with this data stream as it's going through due to different clock rates on different nodes. Canbus arbitration. This is one of the unique and very strong features of the Canbus is that we automatically arbitrate each message on a priority basis non-destructively. That is, we don't lose any time when more than one node is trying to transmit its packet and only the highest packet gets through then the next highest priority and the next highest priority. In this case the highest priority frames are identified with a load numbered COB ID so all zeros would be the highest priority address in there and you'll also go through and see as you look close in here that a zero is a dominant bit that we're driving a one state uh, within the uh, logic of the CAN controller in there is passive. So as each node goes through and is transmitting, they start with a start bit and they start sending the bits of the arbitration field, the COB ID, starting with low significant down to least significant. As they transmit, they're also watching. So in this case, all three of them have the first two bits being a high state, which is passive, and the bus is passive so they can continue on. In the third bit comes, uh, both node 1 and node 3 are transmitting a 0, which is dominant. Node 2 is a 1, which is in passive state. It's a higher numbered message. And when it goes through and sees that the bus is dominant, when it's transmitting a passive state, it drops off and stops transmitting and waits for the next time to renegotiate. The process continues on. Node 3 eventually has a higher numbered uh, packet that node 1 has, at which point it's transmitting a 1 or a passive state, while node 1 is transmitting a 0 or dominant state. Node 2 notices that the bus is actually in dominant when it's trying to transmit a passive, and it loses the arbitration, drops off, and waits for the next period where it can try another start bit after uh, the inner frame time. What this basically says is node 1 came in, started his message, and he continues it, no loss of time, highest priority made it through. Now because each node needs to hear each of these, or, you know, quote unquote, listen on the bus for a dominant state when it's transmitting a passive and vice versa, it wants to make sure that when it's driving dominant it actually didn't have a problem with the bus. It needs to be able to hear from the farthest end of the bus if another node is transmitting. This limits the bus length. In the case of a megabit per second, it's limited to about 25 meters. When you include the time for the transceivers and uh, optional time for isolation, and then it's implemented in some nodes. As we go through and lower the baud rate, the time kicks up all the way up to if we're only running 10 kilobits per second. The bus calls out that the, uh, maybe operate as far as 5,000 meters. For information, see www.quicksilvercontrols.com for additional videos and also for the CAN Open Manual.